start. Hello, everyone. Welcome, welcome. Uh, I, I feel like I haven't seen you guys in a very long time. And actually, that means I haven't seen you in ever, given our webinar format. Uh, but hello, hello, my, my fellow Earthicans. Um, happy World Plato Day, uh, as in Plato. Yes, not Plato, the philosopher. Uh, it is National Velociraptor Awareness <laughs> and International Square Dancing Month. So thank you for taking time out of your regularly scheduled do si -do, uh, to join us for tonight's Skeptical Inquirer Presents. As you know, this is a series of live online presentations from experts who are devoted to advancing science over pseudoscience, media literacy over conspiracy theories, and best of all, critical thinking over magical thinking. My name is Leanne Lord, and I am ever delighted to be your host. Uh, I am a stand-up comedian and author, and I am also the occasional co-host of the Point of Inquiry podcast. I, I hope you've had a chance uh, to enjoy the latest episode that's featuring the one and only Banaschek, which is hosted by our one and only Jim Underdown, and it's available wherever you get your podcasts. And uh, if you haven't already, I can't imagine that you haven't, but get yourself a subscription to Skeptical Inquirer magazine. The print subscription gives you access to the digital subscription. So that's kind of like more bang for your intellectual buck. And uh, you can get either or both at skepticalinquirer.org. And uh, please, please, please mark your calendar for the next Skeptical Inquirer Presents. On September 30th, we welcome Anna Resser and Leela McNeil, who will be talking with us about uh, the women who changed science. I think we're going to need several hours for that one, not just one. Uh, but so let's begin. Um, if, you, if it's your first time here, uh, welcome, welcome. That's a double welcome for you. And I'll let you know that the flow of the evening is really easy. Um, you are already doing beautifully uh, because you're here. Uh, what I'll do is I will introduce our guest, they'll razzle and dazzle, and after which we will open it up for your questions. Um, at the bottom of your screen, you'll see there's a little Q&A uh, icon, and that's the place for you to type your questions in the form of a question, please, and thank you very much. Uh, and if you miss any of the talk tonight, uh, it is being recorded and will be available on skepticalinquirer.org. And now I'm so, I'm so very excited. Our guest tonight is a researcher in applied physiology at Harbor UCLA and the author of The Skeptic's Guide to Sports Science, Confronting Myths of the Health and Fitness Industry, which by the way, was reviewed in the May-June issue of Skeptical Inquirer. See, if you had a subscription, you knew that. <laughs> in his uh, two decades as a physiologist, our guest has supported uh, Olympic performance programs in the UK and, and taught, and I'm going to try to pronounce this correctly, kinesiology <laughs> and critical thinking. Uh, thank you. Thank you. As an associate professor, he is a science writer and skeptical activist with work featured in the Washington Post, BBC News, and in Inside Science, just to name a few. And now as, as someone who has fallen for my fair share of diet and work workout fads and scams. I've really been looking forward uh, to hearing this presentation. So here to talk with us this evening uh, about the science and pseudoscience in sports and exercise, please welcome our guest, Dr. Nick Tiller. And Nick, it is my pleasure to say to you, you have the con. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. Thank you for the glorious introduction. I'm just going to share my screen. And please confirm that you can see my slides. I, yes, I am seeing them, can. yes. And, and, and one other thing, can you see me moving my cursor? This is important for my show. I can. Okay, well, let's crack on. Well, firstly, thank you for the kind introduction. And let me just say a big thank you to the Skeptical Inquirer, and specifically to Barry Carr for the, uh, for the invitation. It's a real honor and a, a privilege to be here. I've been um, a guest in a number of these talks when they've been occurring over the, the many previous months. And uh, so to be on this side of the Zoom for once is a real thrill. So let's 
get on with the show. I was going to start with some trivia and I was going to see how many of the, the people watching knew who this athlete was. And then I realized that his name is on the side of his head. So we'll scrap that. And for those of you who don't already know, this is, of course, Michael Phelps. And Phelps is one of is the most successful Olympian in history, not just the most successful swimmer of all time, but the most successful Olympic athlete of all time. He has won 28 medals and 23 of them are gold. And that's quite a feat. And these pictures are taken at the Olympic Games in Rio 2016. And I was watching in awe, just like everybody else. And when Phelps came out and he stripped down and lined up on the starting blocks for the, for the swimming finals, I just remember kind of watching with my head in my hands because I noticed all of these purple circular blemishes all over his back and shoulders. And I knew immediately what had caused them. And it was an ancient Chinese therapy known as cupping. And I remember thinking that this is potentially gonna have implications, not just for swimming and the health and fitness industry and elite sport, but for potentially for public health and clinical practice, maybe for decades to come. And I'll explain what I mean by that shortly. So I'll put um, Phelps to one side and I'm gonna come back to cupping shortly because it deserves a little bit more attention. I'd like to just kind of set the scene and just give you a little bit more information as to what led me to, to kind of this area and why I'm talking about this today. I qualified as an exercise physiologist back in 2007. I did my PhD in human applied physiology at Brunel University in West London. And immediately before that, I was working with the Olympic performance programs at this place, Bisham Abbey High Performance Center with the English Institute of Sport. Now I'm currently based at the Lungos Institute Harbor UCLA, where I work as a clinical researcher. But one of the things that I noticed when I'd qualified as a practitioner supporting athletes as a physiologist was this stark contrast between kind of the ethos of, I guess, the scientific method and the health and fitness industry. And so if, if we were to kind of draw something of a, of a Venn diagram and on the left hand side, I guess we could call this scientific skepticism. And if we took kind of the, the ethos of scientific skepticism, and that's questioning and looking beneath the surface and asking for more evidence for things, focusing on the process and prioritizing the process of scientific inquiry above the conclusions, humility, all of these things that we associate with being a good skeptic. These things are in stark contrast to what we see in the health and fitness industry, which is very commercialized. And what I've really been trying to do over the past kind of decade is bring these two worlds a little bit closer together. And so what I've done in this talk is try to frame the modern health and fitness industry through the lens of scientific skepticism. And that kind of came to a head pretty much last year when I published my book. And uh, the book really contains more detailed discussions of everything that is included in this, in this um, talk. So in this talk, we will start by doing all the fun stuff. We're going to debunk various health and fitness myths and misinformation. And, you know, being a skeptic, being a critical thinker is in part about debunking myths. But of course, it's got to be about a lot more than that, because sometimes throwing facts and figures at people does more harm than good in some respects. So we're going to be also exploring the um, decision-making process in the health and fitness industry and how health marketing is exploiting our biases. And that's a key one. I'm also gonna highlight the mismatch between claims and evidence because, and, th and there's a huge gulf between the health and fitness claims that are made by manufacturers for their products and the evidence in support of those claims. And then finally, I'm gonna discuss some of the implications of pseudoscience in sport and exercise because it reaches far beyond the health and fitness industry. So I'd like to start by problematizing this area and setting the scene for the rest of the talk because the health and fitness industry is worth, as I said in my, in my abstract, is worth an estimated $4 trillion. And that profit comes from a vast array of different products and practices. So 
you know, from fad diets to exercise programs to supplements, compression tights. This one's a little bit more obscure. This is uh, altitude or hypoxic tents, barefoot running shoes, muscle simulators, gym memberships, so on and so forth. So there's this huge array of different products and practices that are being sold to us on a daily basis. But there are really lax regulations on these products. So manufacturers can make pretty much whatever claims they like, and they don't have to be supported by any evidence. And that's contrary to what we see in, in a lot of other industries. Now, as far as I know, there's only one study that has really looked at this in any specific detail. This is a study published in the British Medical Journal back in 2012. And they looked at over 100 different products, specifically drinks and shoes and, and, and other um, you know, mechanical devices and so forth, and over 400 different performance enhancing claims. And what they found was that over half of those claims were unsupported by any kind of scientific evidence. So over half of the claims made were unsupported by any kind of real scientific research or studies. And when studies were provided to support those claims, 85% of the references were considered to be at a high risk of bias. So they involved small sample sizes. There was no control group or they were in low level journals. What they, what, what the authors concluded here was that there is a striking lack of evidence to support the vast majority of sports related products that make claims related to enhanced performance or recovery. So what we're seeing here is that there is a huge gulf between the claims that are being made and the evidence in support of those claims. And in the health and fitness industry, science is pretty much unfortunately subordinate to marketing. Marketing is king. So this is the extent of the problem. And this is, this is the problem that we're dealing with. And I'm gonna come back to how we go about dealing with it, but let's go back to what I mentioned at the start. Let's talk about cupping. And um, this is kind of the, the myth busting part of, of the talk. I think myth busting to a certain extent is very important. Uh, and what I've done here is, is tackled cupping specifically because you know, it was largely popularized by Michael Phelps, who I mentioned earlier. And after we talk about cupping, I've selected a few different, uh, very popular products and practices in the health and fitness industry and contrasted the claims and the evidence, just to give you a taste of kind of what we're dealing with here. So as you can see with the images on the right here, cupping is essentially when glass cups are placed on the skin at sites of injury or soreness. Sometimes they're placed on kind of body meridians, which you know only really have meaning if you're if you're really into your cupping, and then suction is created either using this suction gun or a heated mechanism. And in dry cupping, the technique is used to stimulate energy flow. I'm saying energy flow here because energy in alternative medicine has this kind of very ambiguous kind of hairy fairy kind of meaning. In science, when we talk about energy, it has a very specific quantifiable meaning. Energy is work done in joules per minute, but the, the use of the term energy here has a very kind of different meaning altogether. And in wet cupping, there's a small incision made in the skin to remove stagnant blood and toxins. The first thing that we notice is that the mechanisms are largely implausible. Okay. They, they sound just kind of plausible enough to, to have some kind of fake air of legitimacy. But if you know anything about biology and about how the body works, you'll know immediately that energy flow, removing stagnant blood and toxins, these are not things that really relate to biological mechanisms. So cupping is considered very much an alternative therapy and 50 to 80% of athletes use alternative therapies. Prevalence in the, in the uh, general population is a little bit lower, maybe about 40% in the US and between 20 and 30% in Europe, but still relatively high. Cupping is a form of energy medicine, just like homeopathy or acupuncture or Reiki, all kind of based on the same principles of, of this kind of energy or energy flow. And to put it bluntly, to believe that these mechanisms have a real effect on the body, you have to literally believe in magic, okay? Because we're talking about mechanisms that don't relate to real science. 
Now, cupping has been studied extensively. Lots of alternative therapies have, and cupping is no different. And this, this uh, one review article here published, here, co-authored by Edward Ernst, found that the effects of cupping are indistinguishable from placebo. Now, what we mean by placebo is this kind of expectation or belief effect. If an athlete or an individual is having some lower back pain and I give them a tic-tac and I say, this tic-tac, sorry, this pain reliever is going to help, you know, cure your lower back problems. There's this powerful expectation. There's a belief effect on behalf of the individual that the tic-tac is going to have, you know, a positive influence on the body. And that is a very powerful psychobiological mechanism. And it's not to be underestimated. Placebo effects are very important in sport and in health but it's very important to recognize that there is a difference between a placebo effect, which is imagined, and a real physical effect on the body. And we're gonna explore the difference in a little while. So cupping is an alternative therapy, specifically an ancient Chinese therapy, and all alternative therapies, whether it's cupping or acupuncture or a chiropractic, they tend to be underpinned by three key characteristics. The first one is that they're underpinned by strong claims and weak evidence. The second characteristic is that they tend to invoke science sounding terms. Now this is an informal logical fallacy called blinding with science. When lots of science sounding terms are thrown out, and again, if you're not very kind of science savvy, and you don't really understand how the body works, these terms are going to be just kind of convincing enough to sound legitimate. But if you know what you're talking about, you can usually see through it pretty quickly. The third characteristic of alternative therapy is that it's underpinned by low quality evidence. So this is, you know, when we see small sample sizes, lack of control groups, and often these studies are published in alternative medical, um, alternative medicine journals. So, you know, the Canadian Journal of Chiropractic or the Journal of Complementary and Alternative Medicine. They look very kindly on, on publications that support their cause. When we talk about complementary and alternative medicine, I like to invoke a, a nice uh, quote by Tim Minchin. What do you call alternative medicine that's been proven to work? Medicine. And so by definition, Complementary and alternative medicine has not been proven by modern science or not been confirmed by modern science to have real physical effects on the body. So I think we've dealt with cupping. I don't want to dwell on complementary and alternative medicine for too long. I'm going to come back and talk about this a little bit later on because I now want to focus on a few popular products or practices and I'm focusing on these particular examples because they provide really neat instances of fallacious claims or unscrupulous marketing. And you know the fact that the reality is that most health and fitness products are not alternative therapies. So let's talk about K-tape because K-tape is, uh, is very prominent in sport and it, it was really uh, almost ubiquitous with the most recent Olympic games in Tokyo. And this is when you see colored tape and it's, you know, pasted all over various body parts of athletes and exercises. It was developed by Kenzo Casey, a chiropractor in the 1970s, and it became largely popularized because K-tape manufacturers donated lots of tape and sponsored lots of athletic teams and individual athletes. And it raised the profile of the, of the brand. And this is something called the exposure effect. And the exposure effect is basically when people see the product as being ubiquitous, it's very, very visible. And then people assume that because it's so visible and it's so popular that it must be effective. And of course, just because something is visible and we see it a lot, doesn't necessarily, it doesn't speak to the effectiveness of the product, okay? So we have to keep that in mind. Now, taping itself is decades old and it's largely effective for reducing kind of the injury risk on injured muscles or, or, or joints or, or, or sites of pre-existing injury. And, and taping is used to pretty good effect, but the difference with K-tape is that they make claims above and beyond what you see with normal taping. So this is from one K-tape manufacturer. K-taping is effective by lifting the skin which optimizes the flow of lymphatic fluids to transport white blood cells and helps remove waste products, cellular debris, and uh, bacteria. 
so again, this is another instance of blinding with science. But in reality, when we scrutinize these claims a little bit closer, they don't stand up to scrutiny. There's no research that actually uh, supports these claims. K-tape has been studied extensively in the literature, and here are just three review articles and one meta-analysis, actually. And they generally all agree this, the, the same kind of conclusions. There are very few, if any, good high-quality studies on the effects of K-tape. There's no benefit beyond that achieved with normal tape. And most importantly, the effect seems to be mostly a perceived effect, a perceived benefit on behalf of the individual. Again, it's a placebo effect. And I labor this point, placebo effects are still important for a number of reasons, but it's absolutely crucial, as we'll see later on, that we learn to distinguish between placebo effects and direct physical effects on the body. Another example that I'm going to use here as a kind of a case study is barefoot running shoes, which is a bit of an oxymoron. And um, again, I just really like the marketing rhetoric. And it's, a, it's kind of a, a nice example to flex our critical faculties. And these are essentially minimalist running shoes. And the premise is that, that modern running trainers with you know, their dense cushioning has caused deconditioning of muscles of the foot and ankle and, and lower limbs and it increases the injury risk. That's the premise anyway. And barefoot running in its current form owes its uh, popularity to Chris McDougall's book, Born to Run, in which he kind of profiled a, a series of African tribes who run habitually barefoot. And it's marketed on a very interesting logical fallacy called the appeal to tradition, which I'll talk about in more detail a little bit later on. But very briefly, the appeal to tradition or the appeal to antiquity basically states that something is good or better because it correlates with some past tradition or some past practice. Uh, you know, in this case, it's, you know, run like your ancient hunter-gatherer ancestors. And it's, you know, it's very appealing. It's very seductive. Um, but again, it doesn't speak to the effectiveness of the product. That's why it's called a, a fallacy of logic. And these type of... Uh, of barefoot running shoes, it promotes a forefoot strike because there's no cushioning in the heel and the, the midfoot. And because of that, there are claims of reduced injury risk. Again, it's been studied uh, quite extensively in this review article, looked at 53 studies on injury risk and found no benefit of using barefoot running shoes. So um, again, the litmus test is, what does the data say? That's kind of where, where I come from, what does the data set say? Show me the research. That's kind of what I'm interested in. And part of my remit and part of the remit of any good skeptic, any good critical thinker is cutting through the BS and trying to get to the truth of the matter, putting biases aside and looking at the data when there is data. Now, the last example that I'm going to look at is protein and high protein diets and protein supplements because they're super popular. And everything nowadays contains more protein than it necessarily needs from cereals to drinks. And there's a perceived health benefit of taking in more protein. So, um, and protein supplement, supplement manufacturers would have us guzzling protein, you know, all hours of the day and night. But let's clarify what protein is and isn't. It is made up of long chain amino acids and protein is important for cell growth and cell repair. So for you know, somebody who's exercising regularly or training hard, then getting more protein is important to help prepare the muscles of the body. Amino acids also have an important role in immune function, but it's important to know that protein is not a magical macronutrient. It won't make you thin and it's not gonna increase muscle mass all by itself. You need to do some exercise at the same time. There's a, a, a turn of phrase in the UK, I don't know how popular it is in, in the US, but there's this thing called bro science. And um, this is kind of the, the hearsay that you hear off your, your friend in the gym. And the bro, bro science relating to protein is that you can consume as much protein as you like, and it can't turn to fat if you, if you take in too much. And that's a myth, it's not true. There are very clear metabolic pathways whereby if you take in too much protein, too many amino acids, it will be turned into fat, fatty acids. 
Again, the literature is very clear on this. If you're an exercising individual, you need somewhere between 1.5 to 2.5 grams of protein per kilo body mass per day. And it is a little bit more nuanced than that. There is a little bit more of a sophisticated understanding. I don't mean to oversimplify it, but um, generally the, the research is pretty clear on this. Again, with protein, as with, as with lots of other products, marketing is key. So don't believe the hype. And some products ride that line between the plausible and the implausible. And um, this is, uh, you know, the, the example I'm going to use here is, uh, is yoga. Now, I've been to a bunch of yoga classes, and I think this is a really nice example because it's not just happening in yoga, but this, but this is a really nice example to demonstrate my point. I'll give you a little anecdote. I was in a yoga class. I, don't, I haven't been many times, but I've been to some yoga classes and I was holding a particular stretch or sitting on the floor. I had one leg out in front of me and the other leg was kind of crossed over. And I was hugging my knee in towards my chest. And the, the instructor or the yogi was walking around the class and in very soothing tones said something like this. So this stretch is very you know good for the lower back and it's going to help stretch out your gluteal muscles it's also going to help boost the immune system and it's also going to help improve your liver function and i remember sort of scratching my head thinking okay i was with you with the stretching part but immune boosting liver squeezing stretches are kind of where i draw the line and I think this is worth exploring in a little bit more detail because yoga is one of these practices that conflates plausible with implausible claims. And um, the problem is that the, that the implausible claims end up undermining the plausible ones. So let's have a look at some of the plausible claims. Many people use yoga to, you know, for weight loss. And it's, a, it's an absolutely valid mechanism of weight loss and it's been studied in the literature and I have no problems with this. You can get uh, improved flexibility from yoga, improved core strength. You can help reduce anxiety, primarily from the kind of the mindfulness meditative aspect of yoga. And there are obviously social benefits of it as well. But as I've said, a lot of, a lot of the time there are implausible claims as well. So we come back to this idea of energy, increased energy flow. And I don't really know what energy flow in this context actually means. Some proponents of yoga suggest that it can promote healing. Now we're getting kind of on dangerous ground here. Boosting immunity. I, I don't know what boosting immunity is. Uh, I suggest going and speaking to an immunologist and seeing if they know what, what um, um, boosting immunity is. I'm not sure yoga necessarily, or certainly a, yo a yoga stretch is capable of boosting immunity. There's also the idea of hot yoga or Bikram yoga. And if the, this notion that if you do yoga or do stretches in a hot environment, that it's going to increase the temperature of the muscle and help you get a deeper stretch. And there's really, it's, it's intuitive, sure, but actually there's no evidence to support the claim. And then finally, this idea that yoga is somehow better than other practices, because all of these benefits on the left Actually, you could probably accomplish most of those by doing martial arts, for example. But some yoga practitioners suggest that yoga is better than other forms of exercise. And actually, it is a form of exercise that can be very effective for some things. It's not necessarily better. So the, the most important thing to take away here is that a lot of people can't tell the difference between the plausible and the implausible. They don't have the critical faculties and they don't have the understanding of the science. And so this is where the plausible claims kind of get diluted by the implausible. So we just have to be mindful of this. So I think it's really important to explore, as I've said, as good skeptics, why do we fall for these extravagant claims? I've kind of set the scene here that in the health and fitness industry, we have these very, very strong claims often supported by very, very weak evidence. So why do we fall for these extravagant claims? And as skeptics and critical thinkers, we kind of need to explore 
the basis of this kind of decision-making process. One possible explanation is in the way that humans evolved to make decisions. So humans have evolved for economy, economy of movement, economy of thought. And when humans are presented with complex problems or complex decisions to make, we employ mental shortcuts called heuristics and heuristics kind of expedite the problem solving process. And it leads us to very fast and sometimes reliable conclusions. And this kind of rule of thumb thinking, so to speak, served us very well many, you know, tens of thousands of years ago when we were hunting and foraging for food and trying to predict the movement patterns of migrating animals or trying to predict the weather. The problem comes because society has changed dramatically in the last, you know, 50 years, but our genes have not. And human genes and human lives are somewhat incongruous now. And so using heuristics in this way to make decisions in a climate that is saturated by big business and fake news and social media can often get us, often get us into trouble. And this is what leads us to, you know, this, um, the one weird trick mentality. This is the, 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 the one kind of the quick fix that we find so irresistible. You know, we can see the dramatic before and after weight loss pictures. No, this is not a real example. And, you know, the, the magic pill or the magic food that can bust belly fat, the trick that the doctor or the nutritionist doesn't want you to know about. It's almost irresistible, even for skeptics and critical thinkers like us, these types of this kind of clickbait is, um, is really hard to resist. Marketing companies know this. And if you take nothing else away from this talk, I want you to remember this. Marketing campaigns are designed to exploit our cognitive biases and exploit our scientific ignorance. And there's a really nice, um, paper here that kind of explores that notion in a little bit more detail. Many large corporations actually employ behavioral psychologists so that, to help them kind of understand the root of human behavior and human decision making. And it's based on just as much science and just as much data as, as any other discipline. So let's have a look at just a few examples of how marketing companies actually design their strategies and design their rhetoric to exploit fallacies of logic. I'm sure most of you know what logical fallacies are, but they're basically errors in reasoning. And um, marketing companies can use logical fallacies um, and exploit them in order to make a sale. So let's have a look at a couple of examples. So we have the appeal to tradition, which I've kind of mentioned already very briefly. And this, this as a reminder, is when a product or a practice is uh, kind of stakes a claim for efficacy or, or stakes a claim for being better or somehow correct because it correlates with some past tradition. So, you know, the paleo diet, eat like your paleolithic ancestors, barefoot running, run like your hunter gatherer ancestors. Most traditional Chinese medicines, you know, stake a claim at least in part because that they're related to traditional practice, you know. This practice has been passed down for generations. It's been used for thousands of years. I'm, my, my reaction is, well, I don't care. Does it work? That's kind of what I'm, I don't care if, if you know, you've been passing down baked fig leaves you know, for, for generations. Does it cure my leg pain? This is kind of what I'm interested in. Does it actually work? And um, whether or not it correlates with some past practice is kind of a distraction. It's all smoke and mirrors. Another logical fallacy that is often used in health and fitness marketing is the appeal to nature. And this one is really ubiquitous. And the appeal to nature states that something is correct or better because it's natural, because it's derived from, from, uh, from nature and contains natural ingredients. The organic food industry is kind of um, hinges on, on this bias. Anytime you see natural produce, whole foods, and anytime you see this kind of this label free from chemicals, and we see this a lot in not just in health and fitness, but in cosmetics. And if something actually was free from chemicals, it wouldn't exist because everything contains chemicals. So it's kind of about understanding the, the rhetoric and the phraseology that's being used. One kind of teaching tool that I often use with my students when I'm talking about the appeal to nature 
is to imagine in one hand, you've got a, a molecule of glucose and glucose has, if you look at it under a, an atomic microscope, has the chemical formula C6H12O6, so six carbons, uh, C6H12, so that's 12 hydrogens and, and six oxygens. And that's the chemical formula. And if you had a glucose molecule that was synthetically derived, derived in a lab, it would have that chemical formula. Now, in the other hand, let's say you have a glucose molecule that's derived naturally. So it's, it's produced you know, in nature. If you looked at it under an electron microscope, it would have the exact same chemical structure and the same chemical makeup. And if you consumed either, either one of them, it would have the exact same effect on the body. It would you know, raise your blood sugar levels, raise your insulin levels to some, um, you know, to, by some amount. But if you actually asked people which one they'd rather consume, nine times out of 10, they'd say, well, I'd rather consume the natural sugar. And actually, there's no reason why that should be the case, but it cuts to the heart of this kind of ingrained bias that we have for natural products. But whether it's naturally derived or synthetically derived actually makes no rational or logical difference. And then the last example I'll give you in, uh, in terms of health and fitness marketing is the argument from authority. And this is a very simple one. It's when you have athletes who lend their name and lend their reputation to a particular brand like Usain Bolt here with Puma. And sometimes when you have endorsements from experts. So when a, you know, a noted doctor or a medic or a scientist lends their name to support a particular product, sometimes they'll be legitimate experts, sometimes they won't. But uh, this is kind of the argument from authority. Again, it doesn't necessarily speak to the effectiveness of the product. So we always need to keep that in mind. Now, the other aspect to consider in terms of why we find these claims kind of very difficult to resist is in terms of advertising and sponsorship and, and the way that we need to consider this in the way that it influences our behaviors and our decisions. Because products are often sponsored excuse me, products often sponsor organizations like here with the NFL, they often sponsor athletes, athletic teams and individuals. And this is great for the manufacturers, great for the brand because they affiliate themselves with success and fitness and you know, beauty and so forth. But it's also good for the athletes because it gives the athletes an opportunity to leverage their social media followings in order to make some money. Now, athletes don't actually make a lot of money. If you think about you know, an American athlete who wins a gold medal, their take home prize money is $37,500. At least it was at the last Olympics. Now that's a nice lump sum to receive, but it's not enough to retire on. And you have to remember that the Olympics only come round every four years. And most Olympic athletes don't win a medal, never mind a gold one. So actually, it's not a lot of money. It doesn't go very far. And that's just in the States. In, in Great Britain, there's no prize money for winning an Olympic medal. So sponsorship gives athletes an opportunity to leverage their social media followings in order to make a bit of money to subsidize their training. Now, this is important because studies analyzing trends in media use show that we are engaging with digital media and particularly social media more than ever before. And you know, there's this really nice um, study here, looking at trends in the use of social media and you know, the, the near demise of print, which I think is a real shame. But uh, young adults get most of their news and information from social media and it's available 24 seven, literally at our fingertips. And this has major implications for the health and fitness industry, especially when you consider the individuals who hold most of the influence on social media. So I'm gonna demonstrate this with um, a really nice example. What I want you to do is just bring to mind three or four of the most prominent science communicators that you can think of. You know, those with the greatest outreach in terms of kind of social media followings. Just bring to mind three or four. And the chances are you probably thought of a Neil deGrasse Tyson, and in this case, I've kind of considered social media influence to be combined Instagram and Twitter. I know that's not wholly representative, but it gives us, um, gives us a starting point. And Neil deGrasse Tyson is doing fantastically well. He's got a combined 16 million followers, which is great. That's great for science and reason and critical thinking. 
You may have also thought of Bill Nye, the science guy, and um, his numbers are not quite as good, but still exceptionally high. Uh, Professor Alice Roberts, who's very popular in Great Britain. She's uh, an ambassador for the British Humanist Society. And the last one that I thought of, just again off the top of my head, was Richard Dawkins. Most of his followers come from Twitter because I can't really imagine him being very active on Instagram. But um, this is kind of, in my mind, that the four, four of the most prominent or most popular science communicators on social media. Now let's compare them or compare their social media influence to that of some professional athletes. So Simone Biles is a really good example. She was, you know, competing at the Tokyo Olympic Games recently, and she's got a pretty good social media following of uh, just under 9 million. Okay, so scientists really hold their own there for sure. Now, when we bring the Serena Williamses of the world into play, she's got 24 million followers, which is pretty much the same as all four of our science communicators combined. And then when you bring Cristiano Ronaldo into play at 430 million followers, what we see here, and not to put too much of a finer point on it, but scientists really have brought knives to a gunfight. And when it comes to spreading the message of science and critical thinking and logic, we're, we're kind of considerably outgunned here. And when we see the frequency with which athletes are using, you know, in this case, Ronaldo's advertising or endorsing supplements. He's using massage guns. He's using muscle stimulators, sneaker. This is absolute nonsense, by the way. There's no evidence that, that this has any positive effect on the body. Advertising sneakers here. It's easy to understand how athletes can pioneer population trends, not just in, you know, commercial health and fitness products and practices, but in complementary and alternative medicine as well. And yes, this is a validated statistic. So why do we fall for these claims? When we look at it through a critical lens, we understand that, that we fall for these claims because of a combination of things, the vast array of, of products and practices that are available on the market, the really lax regulations on which the claims are made. So there's really no accountability for the manufacturers. They can say and claim whatever they like. Marketing strategies that are designed to exploit our biases. And of course, the rampant use of social media in which we're kind of bombarded each and every day with adverts, whether we realize it or not. So what are the implications here? We need to explore the implications and understand what they are. And I can assure you that, that the implications do extend beyond the kind of narrow domain of, of performance sport and even the health and fitness industry. Well, think about complementary and alternative medicine specifically. The health and fitness industry promotes CAM and it's um, the health and fitness industry really is a breeding ground for pseudoscience. Almost all physiotherapists that I've ever been to have practiced at least acupuncture. Some of them have practiced cupping and chiropractic as well. You know, we saw earlier that Phelps was, you know, did his bit to popularize cupping, even unwittingly. And cupping is not benign, as you can see from this picture here that I've, you know, partially blurred for the, for the squeamish among you. And there are risks to cupping in terms of cupping related burns and sepsis and infection chiropractic and acupuncture related deaths. These practices are not benign. We're on very thin ice here. And you know, with, with all medical practices, with all clinical practices, physicians look at the risk to benefit ratio. Well, with complementary and alternative medicine, the benefit hinges on placebo. And when the benefit hinges on placebo, then the, risk, the risks become really hard to justify. So this is kind of an example of how something that's popularized in the health and fitness industry can influence the individual very negatively. Now, the second implication is that pseudoscience breeds pseudoscience. And as I've kind of already mentioned, the health and fitness industry hinges on use of placebo products. The problem is, is that there's really no way to restrict placebo products to just sore muscles and sports performance. 
sooner or later, somebody is going to try and use a magnetic bracelet or acupuncture or cupping or cryotherapy to treat something potentially very serious. And if we condone placebo practices in sport, it's only a matter of time before it bleeds into other facets of society, maybe even clinical practice. And there are many cases in the media and in published scientific case studies of exactly that happening with tragic consequences, you know, people using herbal remedies or, you know, horse medication to treat something that is actually only going to get better with, with, you know, formal medical interventions. And so this, we're treading on very thin ice here. The last kind of implication that I want to explore are the implications for population health. Now, any kind of exercise professionals among you, in fact, you don't need to be an exercise professional to know this, but we're in the middle of an obesity epidemic. It's a big problem around the world. This is a map of the United States. And we can see just uh, looking at the, the legend here that on the West Coast, California, Oregon, Washington, Idaho, we have the prevalence of obesity is about 25 to 30%. So when we talk about obesity, we're saying body mass index above 30. Obesity is a bad thing. It comes with lots of comorbidities, increased risk of cardiovascular disease, type two diabetes. And you know the oranges and the dark reds show even higher prevalence. The numbers are predicted to get by 2030, predicted to be one in two Americans, one in three Europeans. Obesity is a really big problem. Now to tackle weight issues, a lot of people turn to fad diets, the keto diet, the paleo diet, Atkins, the South Beach diet, um, the whiskey diet. You know, I've, I've tried the whiskey diet, I lost three days. There you go, Leanne, you can use that one in your next, uh, in your next show. And the problem with fad diets is fundamentally they don't work. You know, if you, we look at this review article, in terms of fad diets, they're associated with Weight regain, that's generally the rule with one third to two thirds of the weight lost being regained within one year and almost all of the weight is regained within five years. You know, so when we actually look at the, the literature on fad diets, they don't work in the long term. And you know, when we look at these dramatic before and after pictures that we see all over Instagram, the one thing that they usually leave out is the after after picture where the individual, if they've used a fad diet more than more often than not, they'll have regained all the weight they lost and sometimes even more. And this leads to something called yo-yo dieting. So somebody tries a fad diet, they lose a bit of weight, but they, they stop the diet, they fall off the wagon, so to speak, they regain the weight, they try another diet, they lose a bit of weight, they regain the weight. Fundamentally, because fad diets don't treat individuals or, or don't, don't teach individuals or don't train them to engage in long-term sustainable lifestyle changes, the kind of lifestyle changes that are advocated by all exercise professionals or, or all good exercise professionals. Weight, um, weight cycling, as it's called, or yo-yo dieting is a bad thing. It has bad physical effects on the body. It can have very negative psychological effects, studies Studies show that there's increased risk of psychopathology, life dissatisfaction, and binge eating associated with yo-yo dieting. And it's all because rather than implementing these long-term sustainable lifestyle changes that we really need in order to get people to lose weight you know, sensibly, we're distracted by the grand claims and the flashy adverts of the superficial commercial world. And this has a very clear negative impact on population health. Now, it's not all doom and gloom. I've kind of painted a pretty bleak picture, but um, before I kind of wrap things up, I want to just very briefly and try and end on a high note. And you know where I'm going with this. There is a way that we can navigate the commercial health and fitness industry with our bank balance and our health and our intellectual integri integrity more or less intact. And that's engaging in good critical thinking. Yes, debunking myths is part of the process, correcting misinformation when we see it. But good critical thinking has got to be about more than that. It's about pre-bunking, teaching people to distinguish between science and pseudoscience, teaching them how to think rather than what to think. You know, it's that old cliche, if you, if you give someone a fish, they'll eat for a day. If you teach them to, anyway, you know the rest. 
but we've got to engage in really robust, comprehensive, critical thinking. We've got to integrate it at school, not just at college and university. Not everyone goes to college and university, and often by this time, ideas can be relatively fixed. It's got to go into schools, and it's got to be specific and measurable so that we get graduates from high school, graduates from college and university who have really clear and robust critical thinking skills that they can apply to all careers and all vocations, regardless of the path that they choose, not just in health and fitness. Now, how we implement that is not easy. It's a very complicated process, and it's gonna require a different talk altogether. So if, if the skeptical inquiry invite me back, then uh, maybe that can be the topic of my next talk. So to wrap things up then, health and fitness is big business. It thrives on cognitive biases and scientific illiteracy. And it has broad implications for clinical practice and population health. Fortunately, there is a way to navigate it smoothly. And that's the, the wonder of critical thinking and scientific skepticism. I'm gonna finish appropriately with a quote from uh, James the Amazing Randy. And that is no amount of belief makes something a fact. And I, I think this is, uh, is, is such a profound quote because it's applicable not just to the commercial health and fitness industry, which is powered on belief and placebo, but society more generally. And for me, this quote really is, embodies the essence of scientific skepticism. So all there is to say then is thank you. Thank you for your time and your attention. I hope you found it of interest. You can reach out to me on social media, find out more about the work that I'm doing in my book and my personal website. And I will uh, hand back to Leanne and hopefully we can take some questions. Thank you very much. Nick, thank you very, very much. And everybody, um, yes, by all means, do reach out to Nick and his book is out, you guys. I'm gonna, my light isn't showing this correctly, but yes, get a copy of his book, The Skeptic's Guide to Sports Medicine, Confronting Myths uh, of the Health and Fitness Industry. What he gave us here today was an amazing um, taste. And, and, and I don't know about everybody in the audience, but there are a couple of places where I'm like, oh, I fell for that. <laughs> It's really hard. I mean, like you said, they're bringing in professionals to to outwit us with our own humanity. Uh, and that makes it very challenging, you know, particularly the the appeal to nature, the appeal to. Um, uh, oh, what was it? Um, I wrote it down here somewhere, but um, yeah, popularity, the authority. To, uh, there's loads. Yeah, there's to, to ancient wisdom. You know, my grandmother was not necessarily, she didn't have six pack abs. So I don't know why we're appealing um, to our, to old people for this, but um, you, there are quite a few questions in here that I want to, I definitely want to get to. And um, I think, is it Janet? Janet, I think you really hit on one. Um, I could be wrong. Well, I'll scroll through and I'll find it because this annoys me. And this is why I want to ask this question first before we run out of time. Um, I am often scrolling on Instagram and there will be some, I, some tonic, some oil, some thing. Like if you take this, it will improve this thing. And I know it's not FDA approved because they'd never say that, but they have all these testimonials that will have you believing it because it, it, it's hitting you right where your fear is. This will fix your thing. You know, how do we as as skeptics, what is the language we can say or ask just to get people in the comments thinking that maybe this isn't legitimate or should we even be doing that? You know, because, you know, I'm not a scientist, but is, are, is there a language where I get to say, hey, everybody, this is an FDA approved or, or hey, everybody, there aren't real, real, uh, this is not real science going on here. You know, is that even worth doing? Oh, absolutely. The, the more people that we have fighting our bath, you know, fighting the good fight, the better, because, you know, as, as I showed in the presentation, scientists are really outgunned when it comes to advertising yeah, products yeah. and advertising pseudoscience and misinformation. So the more people that can ask those questions, and you don't have to be an expert on any of these things. You don't have to understand the, you know, the, the biological mechanisms. You don't have to be a doctor. You can just ask the question, is there any research to support this? Can you send me any studies? Can you, you know, point me to some, uh, mm. you know, to some published studies? Because 
if something works, there'll be some published studies to show that it works yeah. more often than not. And even when there are, you know, products that are completely implausible, like cupping, the mechanism is completely pseudoscientific. There are still hundreds of studies on it. They all show that cupping doesn't work. It, it's, it's no more effective than placebo. But you can just ask the question. And I do that all the time. I don't, I try not to get, um, you know, caught up in an argument with anybody. I just ask the question, is there any research that you can send me on this? Is there, you know, are there studies that, that can show that this works? Usually they won't bother getting back to you because there aren't. But if you just right. ask the question, that's better than nothing for sure. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Cause I, I often find myself feeling very frustrated and I don't want to get into an argument either, you know, but maybe that just planting that seed, Hey, are there any studies? And if, I don't know, at least one other person reads that question and goes, Hey, yeah, you know, we've done a little something to help our outgunned scientists. Um, there are a couple of specific questions in here. Cause I, and Jessica, thank you. I too do the, I was trying to do the seven minute workout. Is, is that a thing? Does that really work? Is that, is that like yoga? It's better than nothing. <laughs> well, okay. So something is better than nothing always generally, you know, when it comes to exercise and, and this kind of thing, <clears throat> but I guess the questions you need to be asking in the long run really is, are you getting results? Because I, I don't want to turn around to somebody and say, look, this, this thing doesn't work because, you know, mm, sometimes okay. these things do work for some people. But the, the real thing is, is it long term, long term sustainable? If, if something you've got to remember everything that we understand about decision making and heuristics and, you know, shortcut, um, you know, the shortcutting decision making processes and things. If you start to understand the way that humans make their health and fitness decisions, something like the seven minute workout, it just cuts right to the core of all of these biases we have. It sounds great because exercising takes a long time. It's, it's kind of requires a lot of effort. And the mm. seven minute workout sounds like what you can exercise for seven minutes a day and get six pack abs. Usually if something sounds too good to be true, normally too good to be true. Uh -huh. So that that's kind of the general rule. But I okay. would never say to somebody that something definitely doesn't work. Are you getting results? More often than not, you know, with something like this, probably not. But um, okay, yeah, always got to be skeptical. Yeah. Always, yeah, always ask the skeptical and, questions. Oh, that one hurts. That one hurts. Um, but I, it, that to me is right up there with with yoga. I that's why I have such a hard time finding a good yoga class because we're going along, we're doing well, and then the woo comes in. <laughs> yeah they, they sneak it in there and i'm you yes! know I, I, i'm a big fan of fan of meditation i try and meditate every day and i, I, I use yeah. um not to you know endorse any any particular brand but i use sam harris's podcast because uh, um it's his uh his yes. app because it's stripped down and i know that there's no pseudoscience he's not really talking about energy flow he's not he's not sneaking religion in there he's not we're not praying to buddha and any of this kind of stuff. I just want something very practical and applied. And that's what I want with my health and fitness advice. I want something that's going to work. I'm not interested in something that's been that, that's used because it's handed down for, you know, a hundred generations. I'm not interested in something that's going to work because I only have to exercise for 15 seconds a day. I, I want something <laughs> that's, you know, let, let's, let's cut to the chase here. Does it work? Show me the data and then let's see what happens. We are, we are getting close to time and I, I, uh, we have a, a, quite a few people who are asking uh, about intermit, intermittent fasting. I guess that's the latest um, thing now. Your thoughts on that? Is that well, I'll, I'll reserve kind of making a formal judgment because I haven't read all of the literature on it. I, I know okay. what, um, a lot of the literature. I, I know more about the literature than a lot of people who have already made up their minds about it. But um, I like to be, you know, really comprehensively informed. It does work for a lot of people, but the question that, and there are mechanisms as to why it should work. The question I would ask is, what are you doing wrong that you need to start intermittently fasting? Um, you know, <laughs> what what are, what are you doing wrong on a day to day basis? How how is your diet so screwed up? What what exercise are you not doing that means that you have to start, you know? Um, starving your body of calories for prolonged periods of time it's not something that you know a lot of people need to do in order to accomplish their health and fitness goals you, you can generally achieve your goals whether it's to lose weight increase muscle get fit get in shape reduce your blood pressure you can generally achieve all of those things by not doing intermittent fasting 
So that's the question that I would ask is what are you doing wrong okay. in all these other aspects that has kind of forced you into this corner where you're thinking, I'm going to try fasting and see if that works. Yeah. Because so, something's so rather, happened to get you to that point or, you know, to begin with. Yeah. Or well, rather than just clean and maintain your house, let's just burn it down yeah, <laughs> and start exactly. over. What? That'll fix no. it. Well, we can That'll lose, if you want to lose weight, just cut off one of your arms and you'll lose, you know, you'll lose a couple of pounds at least but it's not necessarily going to um, solve your problem for you. You know, sadly doing it things the long way and the hard way is not a sexy sell. It just well, look, really the, the, the thing is when humans um, make decisions, make health and fitness decisions, typically, and we make the same, we, we, we engage in these processes exactly the same as other primates. Typically, if you wanted to lose weight, get in shape, reduce your blood pressure, you could either start eating better, you know, change your dietary habits. That's going to take a long time right? That's a time mm -hmm. investment. Or you could start engaging in more exercise. That's effort dependent, or you could do both. But, and, and most, and all other primates would balance these into temporal choices. When you, you, you know, studies looking at chimpanzees, for example, they balance the two things. Humans have come up with this kind of secret option C where <laughs> you can just take a pill or, you know, engage in a sexy exercise program, buy a new pair of pants, buy a new pair of sneakers, and it kind of nullifies that into temporal choice. It means it's going to happen really quickly and with half the effort. And um, I think humans are unique among primates in that we've invented this secret option C to expedite us to our health and fitness goals. And, you know, as we see from the evidence, it's, it doesn't usually work. Nick, I got to say, this is where you've just lost credibility for me because I bought a cute pair of workout pants and you can't <laughs> tell me that that's well, not that's a psychological <laughs> you know, intervention. If it makes you feel good, then that's a win. Yeah, that yeah, that's my my secret option. C. Um, we we're a little past the hour. Do you have time for one more question? Nick? Sure. Yeah, of course. OK. Um, and let's see, where did it go? Uh, was it Marlon who asked this question? It just, it just, oh, no, no, yes, Marlon, thank you for asking this because you meant, you mentioned this in your talk and I wanted to come back to this as well. What do you know about the health at every size movement and that BMI is not necessarily a good measure of obesity? Because um, you did mention okay, BMI so, once and my ears perked up. Yeah, so no, I've got some pretty um, strong views on this. So you're absolutely right. Body mass index is not a, is not a it's, it's a reasonable measure of, um, you know, relative fatness and obesity but you've got to remember that that it doesn't take into consideration muscle mass so you could get a typical you get a bodybuilder who's got lots of muscle muscle is denser than fat if they're very heavy they could have five percent body fat but on the body mass index scale they'd technically be obese most people are not bodybuilders so for the population as a whole body mass index is a pretty good kind of measure of you know relative um, mass relative to height that's all it is um, but you would never just look at body mass index. You would look at body mass index, waist to hip ratio, body fat percentage. Um, you, you know, you've got to look at all of these things together to, to get all these different pieces of the puzzle. Somebody um, came at me on, on uh, Twitter the other day because they were perturbed that I'd, you know, mentioned obesity in my, in my blurb for the talk. And they, and they asked me, um, you know, why are we focusing on body weight? Because you can, you can still be overweight and be fit. You know, and, and being being overweight is not a bad thing, and of course, you know, there's f fat shaming is is really bad. We don't want to be fat shaming anybody, and we've got to be you know comfortable and confident with our own bodies, and this is really important. I'm a strong advocate for that, but generally, and it is possible to be fat and fit. So you could get somebody who's overweight in terms of they've got carrying too much more body fat than than is healthy, and they can be metabolically or in terms of their cardio metabolic condition they could be absolutely fit they could have no pre-existing conditions and they could be much much fitter in terms of their cardiorespiratory fitness than somebody who's very slim you know if you've got somebody who's overweight who's exercising regularly they can actually be in really good shape despite the fact that they're carrying more body fat than than is kind of regular the problem with that is that being over fat and particularly if you're kind of getting towards the the clinically obese kind of end of the scale does increase your risk of cardiovascular disease. It does increase your mm. risk of type two diabetes and insulin, res insulin resistance. It does increase the risk of certain cancers. There is no um, ifs and buts about this. The literature is very, very clear. It, you know, if you're clinically obese or if you're over fat, 
it does increase your risk of all of these things. It's like driving along. You can have your, your check engine light flash up. The car might still be working perfectly well, but I advise you to go and get that check engine light looked at because it means there's something going on. There's a warning sign, right? Get out of my car, and, Nick. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yes. yeah, absolutely. Oh my God, absolutely. Yes. I know. But, but this is kind of, this is a warning sign. And, okay. um, you know, there are lots of young people who, unfortunately are very overweight and maybe even clinically obese. They might not have any comorbidities. They might not have cardiovascular disease or insulin resistance, but they're at a dramatically increased risk. So yes, you can be fat and fit, but it's better to be, you know, normal weight and fit, okay. right? There's, there's no, okay. there's, there's kind of, that's pretty straightforward, I think. Okay. And I, I apologize. I do this all the time. I lied. I said one more, but I, I think it'd be great uh, to end on Aaron's question. Um, if you could offer some, some good resources for us to, to stay educated about this, um, in, in addition to your book, of course, um, is there anything else you can recommend for us who are trying to do the right thing? Yeah, for sure. So I, I would recommend um, just in terms of understanding decision-making very broadly, I would, um, you know, suggest uh, Daniel Kahneman's book, Thinking Fast and Slow. I mean, it's a bestseller. A lot of people would have read read it already. Thinking Fast and Slow, um, yes. Yeah, because, it, you know, they, they talk about in that book, this idea of system one and system two processes. System one is kind of the emotive response, the the kind of gut decisions, the decisions that we make with our guts that, um, that marketing strategies are trying to tap into. And really what we want to do if we want to improve our health and fitness is make more sophisticated, more nuanced system two decisions. Um, and, and, and the book kind of describes how you can kind of go about doing that. I'd also recommend The Chimp Paradox as well by Steve Peters. I, I hope I haven't got the name wrong. You said so The, the Chimp, Chimp Paradox. Okay. The Chimp Paradox. It's kind of a, a similar kind of um, book. It, dramatic oversimplification of behavioral psychology, but it really does get to the core of human decision-making. In terms of health and fitness specifically, the, the, the sad fact is not enough people are looking at this. And in fact, um, you know, shameless plug, but as far as I'm aware, my book is the only book to really bridge kind of critical thinking and sport and exercise science or the health and fitness industry. And, um, okay. you know, so, so, check that out and um and within that actually the whole last chapter i just i plug other people's other people's books because i want people to to become well read and well rounded and good critical thinkers so I, uh, I end up giving lots of other references in that book anyway awesome awesome well nick thank you uh so much for your presentation uh for for being on this side of the of the zoom welcome it's welcome, been my pleasure right? my honor thank you for having me I, I'm so, so glad you could be here. And I just want to remind the audience that if you missed anything, uh, the recording of this event uh, will be available tomorrow at skepticalinquirer.org. And uh, please join us for the next episode of Skeptical Inquirer Presents. It will be on September 30th. And again, we will be welcoming Anna Resner and Leela McNeil, who will be talking with us about the women who changed science. I can't wait for that. That'll be great. Um, but again, uh, Nick, my thanks to you. You, uh, for being here and sharing your time and your expertise. Um, my thanks to Skeptical Inquirer, the Center for Inquiry, and our producer, Mark Kreidler, uh, and to you, the audience. Uh, my name is Leanne Lord, and thank you, and good night. Nick, thanks again. Have a, have a good morning. <laughs> Bye. Thank you. Thank you.